Hello and welcome to the Vanguard Roundtable, where we discuss topics we believe need more attention to drive the human performance industry forward. Today's topic is trust, data, and technology and hum human performance. We do want to touch on a few housekeeping items before we dive in today. The views expressed today are those of the individual panelists and do not necessarily reflect the position of Fusion Sport or the panelist organization. Please submit your questions in the QA window where you'll also be able to upvote each other's questions. We'll pause during the conversation to take questions from the audience and we'll also leave some time at the end to review any questions as well. We do wanna hear from you and we would like your feedback. At the end of today's round table, we do ask that you do scan that QR code that you see on your screen or it's also found in the chat. Uh, for each survey that we take or that we get from each and every one of you, we will donate $5 to Girls Who Code, a global nonprofit working to close the gender gap in tech. Kicking off for today's round table, we are excited to jo be joined by each and every single panelist you see on your screen. First up today, we do have Joe Club. She is a performance consultant from Global Performance Insights. Also joining us today is Mark White. He is the Chief Executive Manager, CEO of SAR Human Performance. And then we also have Patrick DeMarco. He's a football analyst and director of player relations from the University of South Carolina. And then myself, my name is Emma Osterman. I'm a human performance consultant here at Fusion Sport. We're excited to dive into today's conversation and we're wanting to get started right away. And Joe, I'm gonna start turning to you first with, why is trust with athletes and service members important when it comes to human performance optimization? Joe. Uh, thanks, Emma. Um, so I think that trust is really central to performance. And, you know, anecdotally, we all know, like we all think we know what we're talking about when we say about trust. But in preparing for the webinar, I thought I'd actually look up a proper definition to kick us off. And so I found one which was, the willingness of a party to be vulnerable to the actions of another party based on the expectation that the other will perform a particular action important to the truster, irrespective of the ability to monitor or control that other party. And so from that, what jumped out at me was the willingness of a party to be vulnerable. And I think that's at the core of it. And if we're thinking about athletes, they are putting their trust, they are trying to be vulnerable in terms of all the staff members that are involved in the sports environment. So do they trust the coach's game plan? Do they trust that their training um, practices are helping their performance? Do they trust the medical team that the recovery or the rehabilitation they're doing on them is going to help them physically? And do they trust the strength and conditioning coaches, the sports scientists, that the, the programs, the exercises they're being given are actually going to help them? And so I think that is, they're, they're being vulnerable to the decisions that other people are making. And because there are so many people involved in performance, that is why trust is so critical. Love that, Joe. Mark, I do want to turn to you and kind of hear your thoughts as well on this, especially with your background um, from a tactical setting. Do you have anything to add on to this? Thanks, Emma. I appreciate uh, the, the line of direction questioning. You know, from a service member perspective, I, I served uh, active duty as an aerospace and operational physiologist. And what's interesting about that organizational structure is I fell underneath medical service, but I wasn't medical. Right? I'm not a healthcare group. What I did is provide an instruction to service members about the environment that they were going to be working in to optimize their performance. One, so they could return. Two, so they didn't die, right? And three, they didn't crash a really expensive aircraft. Trust is critical. And I'm going to you know, pull in Joe's comments and I'll just basically put it into a different setting. Trust is critical to the service member that is climbing into the cockpit of the jet because if you can imagine, there is one person, one person only that can take 
that player out of the game. And that would be medical, right? It's called DNF, duties not to include flying, right? And so information and data and trust and technology all line into, I'm a pilot, I get to go out and do my mission. If I walk into a flight surgeon's office and I say, hey, I'm having heart rate issues and you know, here's what I, I'm feeling. And the service member feels potentially that any information that they divulge to the medical community could result in DNF, the interpretation and decision, more than likely they're gonna hide it, right? That service member might hide it from the staff. So critical to operations, both from an aviation side, I suspect it's the same from the ground-based work, is that the team, the organizational structure from the medical staff to the performance staff, all the way to the service member or the player that's actually performing the duties, they all have to trust each other that the data that's being collected will be collected and utilized in good ways in decision-making, right? That allows for safe operations and successful execution of the mission. So that's a really good feedback, Mark. Um, I do think you froze there for a minute, but Joe, I do want to kind of direct it back to, oh, sorry, Patrick, I didn't see your. Oh, did you get me back? There we um, are, yep. <laughs> boy, that's really going to make for a horrible editing. You know? so, <laughs> but in the end, right, trust is critical, and especially it's the relationship building. So I'm going to go back to what Joe said. Absolutely. Um, Joe, I do want to kick it over to you with something that uh, Mark said was the trust within the medical staff. Uh, with what you've seen, especially with, within athletics, is it the same um, same line of thought where medical does have that same, I don't want to say power, but same voice to be able to make that decision on either withholding an athlete from a game? I think um, when you're a medical practitioner, obviously you have a particular duty, um, you know, do no harm. And so, and you, you have very governed responsibilities compared to, the perhaps other members of staff, for instance, historically, you know, strength and conditioning is thought of as pushing athletes, building them up, making them fitter, stronger, which sometimes is seen as a clash with the medical staff as to those that are protecting them um, and, and trying to put their perhaps their health before performance. But in, you know, performance setups that work best in my opinion it's that collaborative process of being to not have siloed departments but have integrated departments and conversations that are considering both the health and the performance of the athlete both the organizational the team's needs but also the athlete's needs and that's can be tricky situations as i'm sure you know pat has experienced but um, that's when those uh, systems are working at their best. That's awesome. And, and I think that's a great segue, Pat. And for most, if, for those of you who do not know, Patrick uh, was a former All-Pro Bowler from the NFL and also served on the Player Association. And I do want to turn this next question to you, Pat. What are some of the biggest concerns of athletes and service members? Is there specific data that is of most, com of most concern? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's all performance driven data that's being tracked. So um, from an athlete standpoint, that data can be used for you or it can be used against you um, when it comes to employment and opportunities um, in that case. Um, and, and I just going back to the previous question, I think trust has a lot to do with how the athlete views the trainers, views the strength and conditioning staff. But, but it has to go hand in hand. The athlete, like Joe said, the athlete has to be vulnerable to trust them. And the training staff has to be vulnerable with the athlete as well. It needs to be uh, more of a friendship, pro professional relationship that's built to, to, to have that trust. Um, I know myself, while I was playing, my favorite strength coaches were the ones that I could have life conversations with. Uh, my favorite trainers were the ones that were asking about my family and really digging deeper than it just in what the root of the problem data they're trying to collect is there. It was more of a holistic approach. Um, but I think 
of of that data that is concerning um i mean it all it, it's so athlete specific um and, and there's always more to the story than just the data that you're seeing um i know some of the stuff that during my time under the nfl pa uh, when i served as the player rep was was teams it was brought up that teams wanted to track our sleep and wanted us to wear wearable devices that could potentially be uh, one or off the clock. And so that was a major pushback was when we're not in the building, we're not on the clock working, that data should not be provided. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, and then the next thing would be, it's the data doesn't tell you what how the athlete feels like the athlete feels a certain way but the trainers or strength staff might think they feel a different way um when when your body's your body and you understand it and you're you know you're master of it um it just there's there's such such pull in both directions like the the best ability in sports is availability and being out there and the trainers and the strength staff job is to get you back on the field as fast as possible are you feeling 100%? Are you feeling 80%? Where, where's the sweet spot on I'm protected and I feel like I can go out there and execute my job without having any fear of uh, harm, hurt, harm, or danger in the back of my mind? Um, so it's just kind of my take. I, I know I answered kind of both questions a little bit there. I love that. And Joe, I see you unmuted and I would love to hear your thoughts on uh, basically what Patrick said. Uh, one of the main questions I do have for you, Joe, uh, from what Patrick said was when you're off the clock and the data that you can collect, um, would you mind touching on that? Yeah, so many points there that um, I could delve in deeper from. And, and obviously, Pat, Pat and I work together um, in Buffalo. So um, we, we, we are, can talk about the same program as well, you know. Um, but yeah, off the clock, that's a really interesting debate, right? Because let's say you have your two hours that's your training, your practice session or your game. Well, we talk a lot about the other 22 hours in performance. You need to be a 24 hour athlete. Um, your day job isn't just those two hours, because as we know, with both health and performance, um, every everything affects it um, in terms of your social settings, family life, mental health, nutrition, all of that is, is not um, just happening within the boundaries of those two hours. Um, and so some context or information from those other 22 hours can be useful to us as practitioners, sports scientists, or any other practitioners trying to support the athlete. But as Pat said, you have to respect their boundaries as a human, not just as an athlete. And so I don't think there's a simple answer for that. I don't think it's ever should be, yes, we should have access to all that as much as we can over the 24 hours, or no, we shouldn't. Um, but I think it needs to be case by case, depending on the relationships, which again comes back to the trust that you build within your program and as a practitioner with different athletes. It's an amazing take. Mark, I see you unmute yourself. I would love to hear your thoughts, especially from the tactical side and with the idea of off the clock, does that, does that really coincide on the tactical side as well? So it's an interesting question. It, so it depends, I guess, if we were gonna go from a legal perspective, what's your contracts? I have two different background experiences that would kind of lend some information to an objective but biasness that I have on the data and how it could and should be used. I worked back in the early 2000s, late 90s, uh, for the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection for wildland firefighters. They were on duty and off duty. But what they did off duty could influence what they did on duty, right? So who should have access to information if it was being gathered and when should they have access to that information? So should your battalion chief know what your sleep habits are? Are they going to make decisions based on that? Maybe, maybe not. 
right? What I find interesting about this is you take that same line of question, you put it in the military, and the contract says that you're, <laughs> you're a military service member 047 365, right? So again, who has access to the information and how are they making decisions? What's really important, and I feel like it's from an organizational structural level, and I'm gonna to allude to what Joe had said and Patrick as well, you're trying to develop trust with the data. So interpretation of the information, right? If I'm not a medical or healthcare provider, I should not be interpreting somebody's sleep algorithms, right? Or cardiac or circadian rhythms to make a decision. You at the medical provider could provide me as a commander some information and I could say, yeah, I trust that they're ready to go or not to go. So I have an ultimate decision, but I don't interpret the information. I use you to make some inferences and gather as much information as possible to then say yes, go or no, go for the player. Um, and so when you start then talking about service members, you know, what information can they gather? What should they gather? When are they gathering it? Really, that's gonna come down to an organizational management type of structure. The big, I think, question that should always be asked is, is it going to be used for disciplinary action? That comes back to trust, right? Most human beings drink alcohol, right? At some point or another. So just because you go out on a weekend and you you drink alcohol and then somebody looks at your Saturday night sleep algorithm doesn't mean you're not fit for duty come Monday, right? So that again, right? Each situation in each setting, as to what Joe had said, really allows for that specific type of questioning. And it should be that robust. We shouldn't make these egregious assumptions and then just gross generalizations because quite honestly, you're going to make a misinterpretation and, and make a mistake. Yeah, I just want to um, jump off of that point as well about, I, I thought that was really interesting, Mark, how you said about certain people having the knowledge and the ability to interpret the data. One of the... Um, interesting things I think we now face are is the the athletes and presumably the surface service members collecting their own data in terms of having obviously I'll, I'll try not to name any brand names but there are more and more technologies available now where um you know athletes can tr contract their sleep which is great and we all have the right to do that my concern as, as a sports scientist has always been, I understand the, the data and I understand the pros and cons of it, particularly these more readily available um, technologies. And so I think that's an interesting challenge where we're not being allowed the data, um, but also athletes are then, are they interpreting the, the information that they're collecting on their end um, and then what are they doing with that? Or how is that influencing their mindset? Um, I mean, Pat, obviously, I think you previously have worn, you know, a device like that. And how did you deal with that if you're, say, waking up on a game day and your own device is telling you you're not recovered? Yeah, I mean, I'm wearing it right now. It's uh, I, I, I'm got wearables everywhere. Um, <laughs> It, it honestly, it kind of it has had its pros and cons. There was times where, uh, as an athlete, you'd wake up and you're like, "Wow, I feel great! Like I'm so primed." And you, and then you pick up your phone and you look at your you look at the statistics that came through the night. And you're like, 40 percent. What in the world? I feel great. Like slept good, and and, it, and it's crazy how like that can screw with your mindset. So go, going into games. I wouldn't even look at it like I it was something that I would look at later after the game because I didn't want that to be in my head because you know all athletes are, are different they handle different stuff um but I I didn't want that information I didn't want to know like I was going to trust how I felt without a device telling me how I felt um but but it is just going into these wearables like it is it, it it's amazing what the slightest thing can do to throw everything off. Uh, I mean, just from uh, the other night, I was watching a couple of the NFL playoff games and 
you know, my sleep recovery score is usually generally 75 to 90. And I had two beers and it threw me down to 30%. Um, and and it, it's just amazing how, but it, it just goes to show how much that stuff does have effect on your body. And then it takes the next day, you're still thrown off a little bit, even if it's as little as that. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's just shocking how much your body can be in flux on just the, sla- the smallest thing. I think those are all really good points, especially from an athlete and then a service member of you, because I think we can all agree that they're not going to be exactly the same, um, especially within the rules of sport and then within the rules of you know, tactical and military setting. But I think that's a great segue, Mark, and I'm going to turn to you for this next question of how do we bridge the gap between practitioners collecting valuable data and the athletes and service, service members providing it? Is it more transparency with the usage of data or is it more education? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? That's a dangerous question. You, you just left it open-ended. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I really think it comes back to organizational structure. How do we bridge the gap? We have different Data is agnostic in the sense that it has no value. It's a bunch of zeros and ones, there are rows or columns, and it's us that eventually interpret the data, this number, it's a three, 48, whatever. And we give it subjective or objective value, either individually, whenever I'm looking at it as a user, or from an organizational structure much higher up, rolled up numbers, thousands and thousands of rows of data averaged out, right? The way to bridge the gap is to make sure that people trust the data. And how do you build trust? In my opinion, right? And I've seen this from a data perspective as a database manager and a developer of data warehouses. Data in and of itself, should be treated just like the three tenets of research. It's accurate, it's reliable, and it's repeatable. If you can't show me that that data has those three elements in it, in that data set, then it's suspect. Now, what makes it suspect? There's a thing called metadata. How it was collected? What standard operating procedures were collected? When was it collected? Who was doing the data collection, right? And I'll tell you this, as a data person, no, data set is pure and pristine. It will always have minor errors and variations. On it. So there should always be a list of assumptions when data is being presented. And so when you start talking about bridging this gap between people, right? You have to have an organizational structure with rules and responsibilities built into it to then collect the data in a meaningful way, a standardized way, right? That then allows for the different views of that data, right? Three different perspectives, user, scientist versus command structure. And they're all looking at the number 48, but they're all seeing it from a different perspective. It's like looking at light through a prism, but somebody's on one side of it, somebody's on the other side, and it's like, oh, the color over here is green. That then, from an organizational structure begins to build the bridge between the gaps that exist from an interpretation and utilization. So, you know, you ask for, is there more transparency? Sure, I mean, that would be great. Quite honestly, I'd like to see policies and missions, right? All the way to doctrine, right? In my opinion, when we set up human performance programs, the human performance program should have a data diction. Show me the data you are going to collect on me, right? Do I need to sign an informed consent as an athlete to make sure that I know what's being collected, when it's being collected, and how it's going to be used? Not because of research, but because of how this this is going to provide some transparency in trusting the data from an organizational level. So, and then I, last but not least, I want to address the education, and I know Joe touched on it as well. You know, in the military, when I was an aerospace and operational physiologist, you know, one of the classic icebreakers I would make during my presentations and their briefings, their right, education and training briefings to the aviators, was I don't want you to be me, right? I point at my badge, I'm a 43 Alpha, I'm a nerd, 
night that is kind of a jock at this night where I'm going to help you be better at what you do. But I'm not you. Nobody's throwing me the keys to an F-16 and say, go out and get bad guys, Mark. That's not going to happen. So I don't want them to be educated like a physiologist. They don't need to understand the underlying mechanism. But I did need them to understand the system of blood pressure and the anti-G strain maneuver that they were supposed to employ. So there was an educational process. At the same time, we would ask questions like, well, if I showed you your anti-G strain maneuver and your cerebral blood pressure in the cockpit, is that going to be helpful while you're pulling Gs out in the, in the training area? That's like, well, that's probably too much information for me. So these are just opinions. There has to be an education process both from the user level, right? Not to make them a scientist like me, but also to a command level. Let me help you interpret this information, right? And how it's useful to you to make the decisions because I can't make the decision for you, but I can help you make an informed decision. I love that. Joe, I do want to, some, some of the points that Mark alluded to, especially with the bridging the gap and how that data was going to be used. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. And then Patrick, I do also want to throw it to you afterwards on, you know, from an athlete perspective, like how would, how do you need to see the data to, to bridge that gap? What was helpful for you? Um, but Joe, I do want to turn it over to you first. Yeah, I completely agree with Mark about the education piece. Um, and similarly, I, I certainly couldn't stand in front of a football player and claim to be able to do what they <laughs> they could do. Um, so that was quite an easy standpoint. Starting point for me was, um, yeah, look, I'm not, I, there's no way, there's no uh, denying uh, your ability is different to mine, but I'm here to help you. Um, it, it's easier said than done, but we, we really would genuinely try to, to show that you care um, you know, was, was there's a saying, no one really, something about knowing and caring. Anyway, um, you know, we, we would say that to all the athletes that we do care about them, we, we do want to use the data for their benefit. And we would try to take that time to explain why we were collecting it, um, how we were using it, how it was being used. Um, for decision making and then being transparent with making it um, available to them as well. I'm sure that um, there were certainly times we could do a better job of that. You can never perfect it. But just things like, um, at, you know, at one point we, we would have uh, paper binders and, and information printed out for them on their test results with their names on it so that they could go and access their information. The office door was always open and players could come in and see their, you know, their tracking data or their testing data. And I, I hope that we did try, even if we didn't always achieve it, to do that education piece, because sometimes I think we need to spin it back on ourselves as the practitioners and think if we were having all this kind of tracking data done on ourselves and being asked every day how we felt and how we slept and if we were in a good mood and then having our steps around the building tracked and how, how maybe how long are you conver con conversing with different people? Um, we don't always reflect on that perspective if it was us. So, um, yeah, I think the, the trust is built on the education and the communication piece and trying to show the athletes that we are genuinely trying to do it and for, use it for their benefit. Now Pat can tell you if he experienced that or not. That's, that's what I'm looking for. Hearing <laughs> Pat, I would love to hear your perspective, especially with what Joe and Mark have both touched on from the education and transparency piece. Um, from your side, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I would say from an athlete standpoint, like I want to know, obviously we know like the athletes know, know what you're tracking. We perform exercises to, to give you data that is basically dissecting ourselves, what we're, our strengths, our weaknesses, areas to work on. Um, but I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't say that we always understood like, exactly what the information was being used for uh we know what you're what you're trying to grab from it but how uh, one of my favorite things that that joe and, and the sports science staff did in buffalo 
was with those binders that she's talking about they would present it to us um and it generally it was only once maybe twice a year where I, I would say that would be something that we that could have been done a little better is maybe do it every quarter or something just so it's constant information so we can constantly know if we're improving if we're staying the same if we're regressing but i, I thought it was really cool what you guys did was like mainly on the force plate testing on, on, on where the output is, where the strengths at. Are you a strong, are you a long and strong athlete or you're a quick explosive burst of an athlete and, and where you are on the spectrum. The spectrum is like, what's the normal for an athlete at your weight size position? Like what are areas that you can work on? How can you work on those areas? Where is, where are you going to, where should you put your time the most be where should you allocate your time to make you most successful moving forward? And then also as athletes, it, it's always nice to be pat on the back and told that you're really good at something too. So like where your strengths are and told like, like Joe is always like that you're, you're really strong and resilient, but you really need to work on being explosive and your fast twitch muscle fibers. And I'm like, I know Joe, I've been fighting that battle since I was 15 years old. <laughs> So, I mean, just, I guess, communication and constant communication and just furthering the education uh, along just so you, so it's not just, we got the information, here's the information, we're going to present it to you one time, and then we'll do it again next year. Uh, I just wish there was more semi-annually or every quarter, just like kind of filling in like, okay, this is where you're at now, this is where you're at now. You're getting better, you're getting worse, we need to change this. Emma, do you mind if I, I tack on something on the education? Absolutely. Mark, yes, please feel free to. And I'll be curious to hear again what Joe and Patrick have to say about this. But over the 25 plus years that I've been practicing as a human performance practitioner, right? Not necessarily a healthcare practitioner. I've come up with analogies and, and the analogies really are and maybe metaphors, but they're because I've done these logic thought problems in my head, trying to figure out how somebody sitting across the table from me is perceiving the information that I'm giving them, right? When I owned a health club, I set up an exercise physiology laboratory, just like it was at Sac State, just down the street from where our facility was. One of the things that I had to come up against with, with regards to informing the public that was walking into the gym and getting a VO2 max test was heart rate interpretation. Right? And back in the day, we were using ventilatory equivalents, looking at different heart rate ranges. And they would ask me, well, but the treadmill has this heart rate range values for it. And I said, well, these are normative values, right? These are not accurate relative to your current physical fitness that I measured when I put a mask on. There was an education process. So one of the analogies I came up with is, you know, interestingly enough, Mothers and fathers, our parents teach us how to use tools. Somebody taught us how to use a hammer and a screwdriver. When do we use it? How do we use it? Okay. But we've got a tool that's given to us at birth. It's called a body. And from the neck down, who teaches you how to use it? When do we get taught how to use it? Now, back in the day when I was going to school, it was called physical education. They don't want to go down that social aspect of it but there's an educational process to understanding the body. And when you look at service members being indoctrinated into a new job and they're going through boot camp, there are plans of instruction, there's organized programs where we have time allotted within a certain day to actually do education and training, which will help the service member begin to understand probably what they didn't understand before. Like how does load distribution in your rock change your physical performance for a specific time frame in this rock? And the elevation gains, elevation gains and changes you're gonna have throughout that period of time. Education and training is important to the person. And, and quite honestly, each setting is slightly different, but like Patrick was saying, they're touch points. It doesn't, you don't have to have this massive data dump. It's like Maybe it's quarterly training. Maybe it's weekly. It's going to depend on, I think, the situation. But it's critical because right now, quite honestly, there's a lot of myths out there. And the health and fitness industry doesn't do a good job of, of you know, 
elucidating those myths. Over. Absolutely. I think those are all really good points from, from each and every single one of you. So thank you so much for that. Um, but I do want to keep the conversation moving with our next question. And Joe, I'm going to turn to you on this. Um, from a technology perspective, uh, devices, databases, apps, network, are human performance programs prioritizing data privacy and security as they should? Um, how does this play into building trust? Jill? Yeah, so that obviously a very um, important question. I think there is um, there's a, a distinction, right, between the health data piece and then the, the performance piece. And I say it's a distinction, but there are some blurred lines there between some data sources. So to some extent, obviously, medical data in the US is um, regulated by the HIPAA compliance uh, rules. Then in the UK and, and Europe, there are uh, there's GDPR now around data protection. And so I think it's, you know, as big data in our societies evolved it's we're now trying to catch up to it to some extent and i think that um a lot of the kind of off off the shelf athlete data management systems can really help you in that sense because sometimes they have a grip on the the data privacy and security um and so you have to be really careful how you're then managing it on your end or if you have an in-house um, system. So I, I think um, th the storage of it um, is, is uh, you know, meeting those needs. I think where there are challenges are some of the kind of the day-to-day -day practices we see where like, you know, we, we like to use leaderboards because we like to give athletes back their information and their uh, competitive beasts. So often, you know, not the entire list from, from top to bottom, but some of the, the, the top scores of a test or the fastest speeds, it, that can help build trust because you're involving the athletes. But then how does that sit with the privacy piece? Um, it's a bit of a gray area, I think, for practitioners. And, and then things like um, if, if you're in a setting where athletes go off to play for their country on international duty, or even perhaps thinking in, in football when athletes are coming out of college and going to a team, or maybe then they're changing teams. What who owns that data? What happens to it? It's in the, in my opinion, bias, the athlete's interest for their management for that data to be shared. But actually, who owns it and who can control that being shared, I think is, is a murky um, area that we face nowadays as practitioners. Absolutely. I think that's a good point. And Mark and Patrick, I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts, um, especially regarding the who owns it. Um, piece, you know, especially Pat, when you retire, um, does that data travel with you? Uh, are the teams allowed to still own that data? Uh, Mark, and from your standpoint, especially with uh, the tactical military setting, if a service member retires, does their data retire with them or does that stay lodged and, you know, with the company that they're assigned to? Um, so, Pat or Mark, I'd love for you guys to chime in. Yeah, I, I, I just retired. I retired after a neck injury um, in 2021 during I, I got hurt during the 2020 training camp. And I, I guess I know that the data is my data, but other than seeing it on those leaderboards or in that packet, like I, I never was giving anything else like the closure of when I was done, my contract was terminated in Buffalo. I wasn't supplied. All my information. I don't know if that's if that's standard. If that's not standard, um, I guess that goes kind of into the educational piece of like maybe as a union we should notify our athletes more. Like, hey, your information is your information. You need to collect it every week. Um, I, I guess that's an error on kind of the player standpoint. Um, but 
Joe, how come you didn't put my top speeds up on these leaderboards more often than more often than not? I only saw my name like once or twice. Was was there a glitch in the system or you, you know, I didn't like to make the other guys feel bad. You you knew where you what speeds you were hitting, really. Yeah. When when they when we posted those every day after practice, I always shook my head when the running backs were passing them around. They'd always joke around like saying, Oh, Pat, you hit a new high speed for you but I mean it's very middle of the pack for our position I'm like thanks guys appreciate that That's funny. I'll pass it over to Mark absolutely that was a great point and Mark yeah love to hear your thoughts as well so I'm going to approach the question from an outside human performance program perspective to begin with right from an industry perspective right data has been being collected for decades and the motivation for the industry, I think, helps formulate how well, right, they answer this question from a technology perspective, are the insurance companies prioritizing data and privacy and security as they should? Yes, absolutely, because it's the bottom line of return on investment, for them, right? Because I know that it's a revenue generator for me. And this comes from a person that, did data warehousing for insurance companies, workers' comp, property, and liability. What I find interesting over the years is, you know, I've continued to stay in the human performance pers uh, program perspective. Data collection and the organizational management of the data relative to this question in that industry, the human performance industry, that's brand new. And so the organizations, you know, are they doing it? You know, you ask the question, are, are they doing it properly where they're looking at data privacy and security? Yeah, they're, they're starting to ask these questions. Could they do it better? Yes, right? And there is no reason why the human performance industry needs to reinvent the wheel, right? What they need to do is look at other industries and understand how they did it and why they did it, and then make the adjustments and changes to their mission. So from a service member perspective, absolutely. The people that, that I've, I've chatted with, it, it, they're asking all the right questions. Is there a program that allows for acquisition and proper organization and structure and doctrine for the privacy and protection and security of the data? It's being developed. Who's responsible for it? Each service, right? Should it follow the service member from the point that they they get into the military, they sign the contract, they become an asset to the, to the military organization, to the Department of Veterans Affairs, right? And, and what back injuries and knee injuries did they occur during their, their mission? And how is that going to look at the longevity of their health care after they're out? Right? So there is a return on investment for human performance. We don't do a good job from an organizational structure in identifying those data elements and tracking it appropriately and creating reports for that. And I, I'll just be very blunt. The insurance industry does it because it's based on revenue, right? Human performance doesn't have this direct relationship from prevention gives me this much money in return. But there are ways that you can organize information properly to where you can show prevention, right? It's usually a retrospective approach um, and it's not research, it's operational utilization of data to where it shows effectiveness, efficacy of a program. My biggest thing when I look at uh, implementation of devices, right, what bugs me the most as, scientist, as a scientist is I'll walk up to a device and says, okay, this device says it's reporting or recording this. Great, show me your validation stuff. If they don't have a validation step, then I'm not going to tell them that their, their product is not worthy, but I say, you've got some work to do. This is why we have standards and metrics and measurements. We don't just create our own metric and say, here it is. We usually compare it against something else. DEXA is the new gold standard versus hydrostatic weighing, right? Because research was done to validate the methodology and the procedures. Um, so to me, implementation of devices is kind of a separate line item for this perspective, but you don't just pick 
devices because it looks cool, okay? We have to have a validation to show that shows that the device is what it what it's reporting and what it's measuring is truly exactly what it needs to be reporting and measuring. I love that, Joe. I see you unmuted yourself. I would love to hear your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I was just interested in what Mark was saying there about the organizational piece and that having the power of the data uh, in in a structured manner that can be tracked over time. I think um, we've seen it in so, some sports. Um, so, for instance, in European soccer, the the um, football research group have done the UA for injury audits for maybe 10 years now, from which um, there have been, you know, meaningful findings in terms of injury incidents. But you, you do require that power and you do require that collaboration. And, and I know as well that, you know, the NFL have various um, research programs going on now um, and trying to collate data from across the, the teams to ha have the statistical power to, to, uh, to carry out that research. And that, that's obviously what we need to do because we need to under, we need that amount of data to understand the patterns. Um, but it can be a challenge in the sporting environment when you are competing against each other. Um, and so I think that is a real challenge we're facing because yeah, everyone wants to, to help but they don't want to help the team that they're playing against at the weekend. Um, and so, yeah, that's just one of the challenges we face in sport that we need that collaboration for, for the data sets, but obviously really the organizations aren't comfortable with that setup. Um, so I, I think that's just an interesting dynamic that we have in the industry at the moment. It's a really interesting thought. Pat, yeah, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I just, from an, from the athlete standpoint, just kind of going off what, what what Joe said, like from the competitiveness, like there's there's injuries and stuff that pops up that an athlete is dealing with, but they don't want to give that information out because they don't want it to negatively affect them. Like I, I know I, I'm I'm kind of wired different uh, and always have been as a player standpoint, but. I mean, the number of concussions that I probably had when I was playing compared to the ones that are documented, I mean, I, I only documented one. Uh, and I mean, there was, golly, a lot of instances where I like stood up and I, I had kind of my own rule in my head was if, if I get my bell rung and I get back to the huddle and the quarterback starts talking and I have no clue what they're saying, get on a knee and don't move. But in that 20 to 30 second, spiel I, for some maybe my brain just works that way but I was always other than that one time able to reel it back in and, and, and come back to my senses but uh, I, I know that that was kind of held against me uh, it was in 2019 I believe I had that concussion against the New England Patriots where I just, uh, and it wasn't a big collision it was one of the smaller collisions I just took a knee right kind of to the side of the head and it just caught me in a funky spot and I remember I went to the sideline and the and I, and I felt like there was something in my eye because like my vision was just blurry. Like I, I had all my senses and I felt fine at, in the moment, but like the lower half of my eye, like it, I, I thought there were we played on the turf field, so I thought there was a little black pebble from the turf in my eye. Um, and I like I, I somehow talked the trainer into squirting water in my eye to try to rinse it and this and that. And he goes, Pat, there's nothing in your eye. Were you hitting the head? And I'm like, No, I wasn't hitting the head. Are you kidding me? Put me back out on the field. So it's just from a contractual standpoint, availability is, is, is your best ability. So you don't ever want to not be on the field, but at what sense, uh, and you guys, uh, the rest of the panelists can probably chime in, are, are, are you hurting your teammates and hurting the team by being out there in such a vulnerable state, um, which in, in, the, in the heat of the competition, like you don't ever want to pull yourself out. You don't ever want to be, considered weak or inferior but sometimes being able to swallow that pride and being able to drop down to a knee and being like I'm not all right is going to help your team win in the long run absolutely and I think that carries through with some of the questions that we have coming in through the through the Q&A chat and I do want to pose this to to the panelists here 
Uh, we do have one regarding NIL, the NIL and data privacy laws and how much control influence athletes feel they have over how their data is used. Um, does anybody, Joe or Mark, do you have anything to add on to that? Um, with some of these laws um, within the collegiate setting, the professional setting, or even in the service member setting, do you see? Do you feel like these data privacy laws um, influence how the athletes um, basically can feel or understand how their data is being used? Joe? I think from my experience, it may be something that is coming a bit more in the future. So uh, as Pat like spoke about very honestly, you know, he didn't receive his data and he said, you know, maybe that's a mistake on the player's behalf. I don't think that's a mistake. I think currently that's the norm. What I'm interested in is how that may change in the future, because I think we, we could see a shift in that. And so it, I just think we we've rapidly increased the amount of data that's being collected and now uh, legislation and even you know what that means for 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 the athletes or the service members is it, they're trying to catch up almost. I would agree, um, especially from the standpoint, you know, of being a former collegiate coach, you know, the performance realm is constantly changing and you know what might seem new now may not be new to another organization that has done it previously, like Mark alluded to uh, before. I do have another question I want to take from the Q&A chat. Um, and Patrick, I do think this is, we will be directed more towards you is, are the player unions helping or hurting when it comes to building trust around the use of data tech? Um, if hurting, what could they do differently that could help both athletes and performance coaches? I, so the union, it, it's, it's different. It's kind of a fine line because when it comes to the owner owners and the union, I mean, it's like kind of a war. I mean, with the CBA, like obviously stuff is negotiated through the CBA, but I, I wish that the union wouldn't, wouldn't push it so much that the NFL or the league or the owners are doing everything to punish them, hold them back. Uh, I mean, honestly, uh, over the last, you know, 10 years, I, I think the league has done a good job of more empowering the players and giving them a voice. Um, but when it comes to the data, I mean, they're just, the union is so guarded in what they want the NF, they're trying to give, give the players as much freedom as possible. So they're trying to protect our data as much as possible. Um, when in all reality, if, this was my idea and it's like i mentioned this a long time ago when i was in the union meetings is if if the union could have some sort of contractual agreement with the training staff with the strength staff if there was more of a joint effort between organization and union i mean i, I just know that if say if our athletic training staff was was hired by the nfl pa to serve for the Buffalo Bills, I know that I would be able to trust my athletic training staff more, or at least I would feel, because I know that the people that had my back and aren't necessarily, I'm not, like, the NFL PA can't fire me, just like the Buffalo Bills could fire me. Uh, if they were the ones that made those hiring choices, that maybe I would be able to trust the, the ball club more because it's a joint group that's not necessarily trying to dissect me and find my vulnerabilities as much, if that makes sense. Absolutely, and I think that's a really good point. And, you know, as we've alluded to in most of this conversation is, you know, how these things keep developing, keep growing and establishing the new norms, it'll be interesting to see how that, you know, continues to grow as we continue on down our path of performance. We are running a little bit short on time, and I do want to get this next question in uh, for Mark. We have touched on this a lot from this conversation, and I would love to just touch on it one more time is, what role does organizational structure, doctrine, policy, procedures play in establishing trust data and technology in the implementation of a human performance program? Mark? So, yeah, we've been chatting about it basically since the very beginning of the podcast. 
and I'll try and make this brief, right? So everybody can, can think that I know. There are two cents. So and mine is really only just about a half a cent. It's not only two cents. It's maybe the point zero zero five. The organizational structure establishes trust from the top down, right? And where, how I'm referring to this within a human performance program is that we need to have roles, responsibilities, proper doctrine set up, policies and procedures, right? And then we fill those positions with people that are actually subject matter experts in the role and responsibility that they're supposed to actually fulfill. Now, how does that build trust? Well, let's go back to the three tenets of research, right? Reliability, accuracy, and repeatability of the data. Okay? I, as a strength coach, should not be the data guy for the human performance program. I can collect some information, but there are true database managers, right? Chief information officers, there's data scientists or analysts, right? And they all fulfill different roles from a data analytics perspective. So if I'm setting up a human performance program, I've got a list of positions all the way from healthcare providers to human performance practitioners, right? And to me, this is one of the things that I have seen industries make mistakes in and in trying to employ this data analytical approach to their industry is that they dilute down because they don't want to create a new position or it's too expensive, right? It doesn't provide revenue for it. You know, IT is not really important to us because it's a red line item. It's not a black line item. I can't make money off of it. But if an organization can truly establish at least some basic roles and responsibilities from a data perspective, that trust is usually easily translatable to the other person right, that's sitting on the other side, whether it's commander or user, right? It's an athlete or it's an athletic director, that there is objectivity and unbiasedness in the approach that the data is being stored, collected, right? And then interpreted. Because as a data person, I probably don't necessarily have the background to make these decisions, but I can do some wonderful things in helping develop queries and answer questions, right? And then I also understand from an organizational structure as a data person, privacy and security, right? And who gets access to it? And I control that, right? And there is no real bias as a data person as to well, I can be bought out easily, or I'm going to get this different promotion because I'm a strength coach managing this, and then the coach asked me for that data, right? And I'm just throwing out hypotheticals there. That type of investment will build the trust. Absolutely. Joe, I know Mark alluded to some things in sport. Do you see that being able to transition uh, in the sport, sport realm based off where you were from previously? Yeah, so oh. I agree with um, a lot of that what Mark said, and again, in my very biased view, I think that the Buffalo Bills organization has done a, a phenomenal job of that. And I think that's part of what we're seeing now in terms of both injury outcomes and performance outcomes, um, in terms of having um, brought in a phenomenal director of analytics and app management and have taken data management in-house recognizing the the knowledge of the experts in their area bringing in staff who can connect the silos and try and use that I think one of the challenges that we face that may be more specific to sport I, I don't know how it works in, um, in the military um, is every year in the NFL you start with 90 athletes and you well previously it was 53 and plus 10 and I think it's changed in the last year but you know and and Pat has obviously experienced this as an individual you're, you're lining up in the summer and you're looking around you know 20 to 30 of the people around you will not have a job will not be in the organization come September and so then the data that is being collected on you you naturally think that it is being used towards that decision-making. 
And so that is a really big challenge as a practitioner because that is a fact. That is what is going on. Um, but you have to try and build the trust to, to with the athlete that you you have their individual best intentions in mind, even if you cannot personally guarantee that they'll still be a member of the organization in a few months time. Um, and that that is a really big challenge in sport and in particular in, in football. Absolutely. Pat, I do want to give you the opportunity here to also touch on this. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree. It, it's really tricky and it, it, you know, it's a numbers game and, and, as you, you know, you start the off season with, with 90 guys and then you trickle it down and only so-and-so gets invited to camp and then the first round of cuts. So you're looking around and you're like, all right, well, and you're, and you're just waiting. You're like, okay, we, we still have this or this position left. And, and you're playing a numbers game, which, which on top of like trying to execute against giant human beings that are much bigger and stronger and faster than you, and then you're also playing mental games, um, trying to figure out where your life is going to look like here in the next couple of months. It's, uh, you know, it's pretty tolling, um, but you have to, uh, I think it goes into like trusting those analytics and having the relationships with those people that have, that you've entrusted to have your best interest at heart. Um, and you just kind of have to, you have to be vulnerable and you have to go all in. Like you can't, like the problem is, is when athletes start to play those mind games, they've already kind of lost um, because they're fighting against themselves, not not to mention fighting against uh, their true competition. So, um, yeah, it, 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 it's tricky. And, um, you know, you, you wish that everyone that put in the time and effort could uh, could reap the benefits, but it, it's a competitive state and there's only, you know, 2000 of those jobs, uh, in the world. So, um, that's why all those analytics and all the data really, really means a lot. Uh, I know we're, we're kind of losing, uh, times counting down, but I, I had a question for Joe, if, if that, uh, if that's possible for me, but like when it comes to that data and even Mark can chime in, but I guess an athlete, I, Unfortunately, I peaked at a young age. Like I peaked when I was probably 24 years old. I was as strong as I was ever going to be. I was as fast as I was ever going to be. And like, it just, I, it never was, the, the more training I could do, like it, I was always going to stay the same. And, and I was going against athletes that were much bigger and stronger and faster than me. And they were constantly climbing. So like from doing the force plate analysis and, and, and the groin squeeze and this and that, like I knew where I was at. I knew what my favorite playing weight was as a player. And it necessarily, I, I didn't see eye to eye with when it comes to where my strength needed to be or where my weight needed to be with the staff. So I, I just don't, if I always struggle with this, cause I wanted to be lighter cause I realized that I was strong, but I realized what I lacked was speed. So Teams wanted to be heavier because maybe I was stronger, harder to knock back. But if I felt that at a, at a lighter weight, I was able to run and I wasn't getting knocked back, why do I need those extra three or four pounds? So I, I guess if Joe, you could chime in because you know kind of the whole situation directly. And then Mark, uh, in a similar boat with you in the military, I'm sure there's a lot of that as well. Yeah, I, th I, no one knows, right? Like performance is complex. Hmm. Performance, unless you are um, a sprinter or a cyclist, for perform defining performance for them is straightforward, more straightforward, right? Whoever runs the fastest cycles fastest. In in team sport, it's much more complex, and in football, in particular, given how complicated the game is, it is more complex. So people have to blend the art and the science to come up with what approaches they think are best who was right or wrong about your best weight for example playing weight we will never know um but i i personally think that the athlete's um voice is important that is a piece of data in itself even if it's not a piece of technology and we, for instance, with wellness, we try to capture that. How are you feeling today? 
we try and make it objective. But also, you know, we would like people to come in and sit on our couch and tell us how they're feeling, because, again, that is a piece of data. Um, but sometimes people can get lost in the numbers and people can get a set range or a set target or a set number in mind as a practitioner or as a player. And they can focus on that and think that. So there are clashes like you describe in terms of what the athlete feels, what the practitioner feels. Over time, in some ways, again, the more data that we collect, the more informed we can be. And so maybe actually in five years time, if you were that 24 year old again, we maybe had a better understanding of how physical preparation relates to performance, how force plate data relates to performance. And maybe at that point, we could give you better training interventions that actually did make a difference. But it's always, it, that comes back to our first, I guess, full circle to the first point of like, there's lots of different voices in, in, in human performance, which is a, a mixture of, of art and science, of objectivity, of subjectivity. And, and hopefully when everyone's listening to everyone, it, it works well. And then other times, perhaps it doesn't. Mark, would you like to add on anything? Yeah, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting question, Patrick, and I've got to agree with Joe. You know, the way I approach that, that you know, kind of the question that you're asking, uh, you know, there's more than just somebody's physical readiness, right? All human beings have the same biomotor abilities. They're all developed slightly differently, and it depends on the performance or the job task that you want out of the individual. And I would have looked at your position and said, okay, Right, it's, it's kind of like the, excuse the, uh, the, the television show pun, but it's the Roy Kent effect, right? It's a, oh, you're old, he, but he has skill and proficiency and there's maturity and he can teach other people things. So, you know, you're not washed up because you don't have the same physical biomotor abilities that you did at the very beginning, right? And so you look at service members, that's why we have rank, right? You start off in an E1, right? Or, lieutenant and then you gain that rank skill and proficiency so maybe you're not out there on the front line every day but there's still importance right that you contribute to the team that improves overall performance and then from a service member perspective it's mission and performance and to me there's more than just the physical readiness right you you know in a session and a selection perspectives in the military and so, oh, you have a bench press or a deadlift or 315 pounds, you're in, let's go. No, we need to look at a few other things too to see how this holistic approach to performance and this individual is prepared for that. And that's one of the, quite honestly, the tricky parts to performance, it's readiness. Ooh, what does readiness mean? Well, oh, that's kind of sticky and gooey, right? And there's gonna be different domains of readiness, cognitive, logical, spiritual, physical, um, so, at least from my perspective, I, that's how I would approach at least that line of questioning. You know, I, I wouldn't have taken you out of the game quite yet, or I wouldn't have said, hey, Patrick, throw an extra three pounds on. That's going to help you. That is the key. It's like, really? Are you sure? I love it. I used to, I used to chug waters before I had a way in to make sure that I was like two or three pounds heavier, and then I could just go to the bathroom and get that weight right off of me. So, there's tricks to the trade as an athlete, too. Oh man, Joe, Patrick, Mark, this has been a wonderful conversation. Your guys' insights on this topic has been, I know a learning uh, experience for myself and as well as the, the, attendance, the attendees we have as well. But as I mentioned before, we are running a little bit short on time and I hate to cut us off, but we thank each and every single one of you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, Joe, Mark, Patrick, myself, we do invite our panelists to connect with us uh, via our social media handles below. Um, moving forward, like we mentioned at the beginning, we do want to hear your feedback. Uh, please take three minutes to tell us what you thought of today's uh, roundtable and what topics you would like us to consider for future sessions. Uh, once again, for every survey completed, uh, we will donate $5 to Girls Who Code, a global nonprofit working to close the gender gap in tech. That QR code is up on your, on your screen as well in the chat channel. We do want to make you aware that we have some more upcoming roundtables uh, next month, the fitness gap, 
And then in March, body image and performance. Uh, please sign up when notified uh, once registration opens. Once again, Joe, Patrick, Mark, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Each and every one of you provided so much great information and we look forward to hearing and seeing everyone next time. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Awesome, thank you all. Thanks Emma.